Check out clothes. All right, we are on a very tight schedule because they've scheduled everything back to back. So we are, we're going to start very promptly. Um, I'm Jenny Lee. I'm a board member of Hacks Hackers, and I'm your moderator and sort of the, the lowest key member of the panel today. Um, we are determined to have the best panel uh, that you will attend this year at, at IJF. Um, and so, you know, when you when you leave, you should tell people how awesome it is. So I'm just going to introduce all the panelists um, and then kind of get into a, a specific working definition um, of what a meme is in our context. So just kind of going down, everyone. Um, this is Joanna Geary. She's head of curation or curating at Twitter. And then Claire Wardle, who is in the in the blue, is the research director of First Draft News and essentially the head of First Draft in um America. Then it is um, Farida Viz, who is the director of Visual Social Media Lab at um, the University of Sheffield. And last um, but not least is An Xiaomina, who is head of product at Medan and also a per uh, Berkman Klein Fellow. And actually, An is going to be the one that kicks us off. So, um, in the context, there are many, many definitions of memes, but in the context of this panel at a journalism conference, we are going to, the one that we are going to be working with is a digital object that is shared and remixed by multiple people. Um, there are, you know, scientific definitions and sort of sociological definitions, but in the context of our conversation, that is what we're going to be working with. And now Ann will kick us off with her uh, lovely presentation. We, we actually have... I will say, hands down, the best slides of any presentation um, at the conference. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Jenny. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I hope I hope we can live up to um, uh, to expectations here. Um, so I wanted to just to give examples of memes. Um, I think it's helpful to remember what a meme is. Um, there are the very si silly ones, right, that we can think of: the cat videos, the dog videos. Um, you have the Nian cat, um, which is again, it's a it's an object that's remixed by many people, um, and uh, has has your know, typical form as a pop tart cat, but has many variations. So. The important thing here is that there's no single one. Um, and it's going to take video form, visual form. Um, so in the video, for instance, the Gangnam Style, if we remember the Gangnam Style video, there are countless remixes of those. And so in many ways, Gangnam Style is a meme par excellence in the same way that Nian Cat is. Um, but memes are not just silly. And memes have a very serious component as well. I did research in China around activist memes. These are, activists, these are sunglasses selfie memes, um, where people are posting selfies wearing sunglasses as a show of support for the blind lawyer activist, Chang Guangcheng, who had been disappeared. So it had very serious political organizing purpose, and my co-panelists will be talking a lot more about that in more detail. Um, so what I, one, one of the things I hope we take away here is that memes reflect cultural undercurrents. They come from a culture. They are not isolated to the internet, but are often informed by, um, by larger cultural currents. Um, so we did, a, 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 we did a, a map for the Museum of the Moving Image that looked at memes, animal memes, just animal memes in a global context, and worked with dozen, over a dozen researchers, looking at something as simple as animal memes, the assumption that cats have taken over the internet, we wanted to interrogate and look at. And so when you dig into these different cultures, you'll see that llamas, for instance, are more popular than cats in many Latin American contexts. Olekaase means uh, what's up. It's a misspelling of that word. Um, and llama in the Chinese context is more of a political connotation. It's more of a FU to internet censorship. And so um, it, it takes a different transformation in the Chinese context. Car, donkey humor is much more popular than cat humor in Tajikistan uh, because there's a long tradition of donkey humor in the country. Um, Team Mafisi is a Kenyan, it's a Kenyan um, hyena humor um, around, um, you know, kind of labeling people as a part of a Team Mafisi. Um, and then goat humor is particularly nascent in many rural countries, especially as the rural internet comes online. You see, you're seeing more goat humor than you're seeing cat humor. And so all of these things come from a cultural context and from a history. Um, and then in, in places, the researchers who worked in Iran and Syria noted that there's not as many animal memes, but instead are more political memes. Um, and around the color green or around handshakes, things like that, that are much more important in these contexts. And so that's a good transition to looking at, you know, in the U.S., so that we call it the 20, 2016 was the meme election. And so many articles talking about that, but it's, it's, it's useful to dig into what that means. And um, again, my co-panelists will look at this more deeply, but 
Um, what, I, what I want to, another takeaway that I think is important here is that internet memes have an affirmative, emotive role in digital space. Um, if we think about the internet as an information superhighway, I think it's useful to think of it as an affirmation superhighway. People are looking for validation around identity and to express, um, express like what they care about and their political inclinations. So the very simple example is the marriage equality memes where people are putting rainbow flag overlays over their profile pictures um, during, uh, during conversations around marriage equality in the United States. Um, but you also have what's happening now is physical memes. You have people remixing, like this artist, Jeronimo Saldana, um, who's remixing the red hat, the Make America Great Again hat, turning it into Make America Mexico Again hats. And he would post these online, people could buy them, and he could use that profile picture as a way of indicating his political allegiance. Um, you see a variety of red hat remixes when you, when you start looking around. This is a photo I took from the Women's March in DC. And so when we think about memes, I think it's useful to think about the entire memetic context. Um, so you have, you have an event, like someone's calling another presidential candidate such a nasty woman. Um, nasty woman hashtags pop up in seconds. You have text-based memes. Then you have visual memes. You have people remixing the nasty album by uh, Janet Jackson into a you know, picture of Hillary Clinton. Um, and then you have product memes. You have the hats, you have the bags, you have the pillows, you have the pins. Any sort of product you can think of, there's a variation on that. So, you have, so if you search on Google Shopping, you can find countless nasty woman um, uh, products. Um, and those are, you know, enabled by certain tools like Teespring, Vistaprint, and others that make it easy for you to take an idea like hashtag IJF17 and turn it into a product that can be sold online. Those products, as they ship, become part of selfie memes because people are taking pictures with them. That's a picture from a democratic fundraiser. And then on and on and on. And so there's countless remixes. So when we think about memes, it's important to understand that increasingly they're a part of the physical world. They're not just isolated to the internet. And also that they interface with larger media environments, which my co-panelists will talk about in much more detail. So those are the few takeaways. And uh, thank you very much. So I'm uh, really not going to say much. First of all, I'd like to apologize for our woman null, not a man null, a woman null. We've got more diversity on this panel. We should have sprinkled it around a bit. But um, uh, well, first, of all, I'm going to talk very briefly about the way that I'm concerned about memes in the misinformation ecosystem. And for those of you who didn't listen to this This American Life episode, where they basically went to the Deplora Ball uh, during the inauguration and talked to people who believe very much that memes had played a role in Trump's We life. did it. We memed him into the presidency. You memed him. We into memed the him into Raise power. Hand. We shit posted our way into the future. It's true. This is true. This is true. Because we we directed the culture. So this is why it's so fascinating to me. And somebody who I have a background in uh, communication, I did a PhD in communication and cultural studies is part of that discipline. And people look down at cultural studies as a discipline. And I want to get us back to understanding the role of something like memes in terms of understanding the cultural relevance of this. And that's why Arne's work is so important and Farida's work is so important. Um, but you know, if listen to the whole This American Life episode, it's from a couple of months ago. Uh, it's quite incredible when you listen to the sophistication of their use of memes from the alt-right perspective with a very clear sense of what they thought they were doing and how they were directing the culture. And so um, if you haven't read this piece by Ryan Broderick, uh, it was a BuzzFeed piece a couple of months ago where he basically got incredible access to uh, kind of an equivalent of Slack, a platform called Discord, and somebody let him into these communities of US teenagers trying to influence the French election and the process that we're currently seeing. And these 16-year-old boys, always 16-year-old boys, basically doing what they were doing in their bedrooms. And they actually talk in the article of like going back downstairs to dinner with their parents, being like, what have you just been doing, Chad? Well, mum, I've just been memeing. I mean, it's a fascinating example of how their parents weren't understanding and were just dismissing what these teenagers were doing. But these teenagers, when you read this article, are using all the tools that we take for granted. So an equivalent of Dropbox to basically create these meme shells. So they're talking to one another saying, well, we don't speak French. So how are we going to impact this election? It's OK, we don't need to speak French because just take these meme shells from the equivalent of Dropbox, and you can just push them into the Twitter sphere. And they talk in great depth about how they could target certain Twitter users, saying, this person with this type of profile picture and this type of profile is interesting. They must be racist, but not too racist. We don't want to actually show people what we're doing. I mean, very sophisticated ideas about how they can connect. They're using Google Forms, Google Docs, the equivalent of Dropbox, the equivalent of Slack, to coordinate with each other to say, how do we actually change what we're seeing? And so 
all of these meme shells essentially sitting in Dropbox that anybody can take and push into the Twitter sphere. So when you actually look at how sophisticated this is and the knowledge that they had of the power that memes could play in shaping the election, that for me, when we think about the misinformation ecosystem, um, if we don't think about visuals and we don't think about memes and the roles that they're playing and the sophistication that they have in culture. And anybody who has studied comedy, there's been some really interesting research around the role of The Daily Show, for example. The reason that comedy is actually so persuasive in terms of what people learn around politics is that it's an nth meme. An nth meme is something where you have to make sense of something. If you know John Stewart is making fun of George Bush being a bit stupid, you have to understand why that's funny. In order to laugh at the jokes about Trump, you have to understand what's actually happening with the Senate committee hearings around Bet Betsy DeVos. So actually, memes work on a much more sophisticated level in terms of how people consume that information. So rather than dismissing them as just humor, funny, teenagers having a laugh, they're actually much more sophisticated than a fake news article, a text article that people are actually, you know, Macedonian teenagers creating for profit. This for me is something that we need to think about. But if you think about it from a platform perspective, this is much more difficult for, you know, using computation to pick up memes. You know, one thing you can do a, you know, a domain registration search and work out that a Macedonian teenager created the website two weeks ago in Macedonia, that's a pretty easy shortcut for Facebook to say that you know, that URL is probably problematic. When you're talking about memes, it's much more difficult to start tracking that, understanding it, make sense of it from a computational perspective. Um, so just very finally, I was on a TV show in, in Sydney a couple of weeks ago, uh, and I was wearing the same shirt as I am today, uh, and I was talking about weaponized memes. I was talking about this. And then afterwards, there were comments on Twitter, and this popped up, uh, where somebody had clearly recognized that I should play a part in Wicked, didn't know that I looked so delicious in green. Um, and then the next minute, this has got remixed into this, uh, which many of you know, Peppy the Frog has huge significance as a racist, um, yeah, and used in memes with a racist connotation. So uh, I'm gonna carry on talking about this stuff and I will recognize that I will probably be part of this too. Uh, but this is, there's the dark side to memes, there's the amazing side of memes. It's really sophisticated. And again, uh, I think Joe and Farida are gonna talk about what does this mean for journalism? How do we make sense of this? How do we make sense with our audiences? How do we make sure that we're not looking like the, you know, your dodgy uncle at the wedding dancing because we don't really understand how to dance properly? And my, my worry here is as journalists, how do we make sense of this without looking like we shouldn't be there? So thank you, I'll leave this up. <laughs> This is now, yeah, here we go. Okay, so you were promised the best slides. Um, we had a slight technical problem. So if this panel turns out to not have the best slides, please blame uh, the pregnant lady. Okay, so um, what I wanna kind of um, talk about and, and building on what's been said so far is just how sophisticated, and Clara's already said this, how sophisticated and complex memes are. Um, because when you're dealing with images, um, which a lot of, um, uh, obviously what we're talking about is not just memes, but it's visual content. I think a lot of what the sort of the solutions or proposed solutions to the misinformation issue are focusing on is really on text and what can you do with algorithmically, what, you know, what can you flag and so on. When you're dealing with uh, visual content, you're dealing with, you know, it's a completely different ball game. So this morning when I was in a panel um, on misinformation, I was really um, struck by Onye's comments about Facebook and this kind of idea of in informed um, communities. And as a communication scholar, immediately, you know, that makes me think about power. Um, informed according to whom? Um, to what end? Who judges? Who is informed or not? Because of course, communities can argue that they're very informed. They just not may not be informed in the ways that we want. So this is a much larger conversation um, also about these wider structures. So I think, and Claire's already kind of um, highlighted some of this, is I think what we have to be very, very careful about is putting kind of almost like parental guidance stickers on some of this content, um, because we all know how well that works. Um, because I think you can basically trigger um, a sort of catnip-like reaction that ends up having the complete opposite effect to what you're sort of trying to, you know, warn people about. People don't care that, you know, um, junk food is bad for them. They still want it. 
Um, so when we're talking about images and memes, they're often shared very quickly to comment uh, on, on new situations. Um, but I think what I want to dig into a bit more deeply is that they can function as acute social commentary, right? So we're not just talking about lolcats here. Um, we can talk about very sophisticated visual ways to speak truth to power. Um, therefore, the kind of the idea that they're potentially true or false is not that useful when it comes to images. This is always very, very contextual uh, meaning shift. It, it depends on um, who is mobilizing them, in what context, national context, what time, and so on. So in terms of a typology, and Claire's done um, some really uh, amazing work on kind of thinking about typologies for misinformation, what does this look like when you're dealing with memes and images? Again, it becomes much more complicated. Um, and also in terms of thinking about the skills that we need to interpret them. So I want to go back um, more than 10 years ago um, to Hurricane Katrina, which happened in 2005 um, in the States. Um, and my disclaimer here for returning to a really, really old case study is because so much research has been done on this. And so what I think is really useful when we look at the memes around Hurricane Katrina and we look at the kind of visual content that's come out of Hurricane Katrina in order to kind of try to map what might some responses um, look like in the current, the current day. So when we're looking at Hurricane Katrina, we are not yet dealing really with a kind of a social media issue. We are dealing with a mainstream media issue where it was essentially the mainstream media that was peddling a lot of falsehoods about a particular poor population in the US, right? So they were tapping into widely held beliefs about African Americans, right? So instead of kind of like focusing on the content, like is this true or false, like a bigger question could be when you're dealing with issues like misinformation is what are the deeply rooted socioeconomic and political reasons African Americans are seen as looters in the aftermath of an event like a hurricane? That's a crazy hard question to answer, right? That's the really substantive hard stuff. Is there a flag for that? Spoiler alert, no. So if we look at some of these memes, um, one of the things that came out straight after is this kind of controversy that exploded on Yahoo News, which uses mainstream media images, so this is from Agence France Press and from um, Associated Press, that basically said black people loot and white people find things, right? So this exploded in the kind of nascent blogosphere. Um, there were uh, very early memes of George Bush, uh, father and son, fishing in the floodwaters, and which kind of culminated in this um, outburst by Kanye West. Um, you know, then I guess we weren't that used to his outburst. Um, but so in 2005, he had this outburst on a live um, kind of fundraising event next to uh, Mike Myers, where he essentially like went off script and suggested George Bush doesn't care about black people. And so this is a very, very early example of um, a sort of a set of memes that make very astute social commentary on a very complex political reality. So these are really not for the lols. So, one of the sites that I think is really, really useful to um, start talking about when we're, we're thinking about you know, solutions or what can journalism learn from how meme cultures have grown up, but also how people are, are dealing with memes and processing and archiving them, is a site like Know Your Meme. So Know Your Meme basically writes very deeply around the context and the history of particular memes and keeps updating that context. So one of the memes that came out of Hurricane Katrina is this um, deeply racist meme called Looty. Um, and one of the things that I particularly like about um, what they write about Looty um, is that this is a really good example of you know, how sometimes internet memes can be racist. And you kind of think, it's not really internet memes that's the problem here, um, it's the racism. Um, but, but what I think is very useful about that is A, how deep they go in terms of the content, but also how fast they move. Um, and I know that Joanna is going to talk more about um, the, Pepsi, the Pepsi ad, but this basically happened yesterday, and already there's tons of memes and already a substantive write-up on, on uh, Know Your Meme. So what you have to kind of bring to this reading is incredibly sophisticated, right? You have to understand you know, first of all, what is this movement that they're tapping into? You know, what are these much larger issues around police brutality? How come they're using iconic imagery um, from the Kent State shooting, um, for example, to comment 
on a Pepsi ad, how come they're using and remixing other memes, right? So they're also reusing Pepper Spray Cop. I don't know why, but I think these are the really big substantive questions where research can, can dig much, much deeper and, and try to help. So in terms of research, one of the things that we know a lot about is we know that there are certain ways in which people respond in the aftermath of certain events. We know this in terms of uh, natural disasters. We know this in terms of terrorism, right? We know a lot from different disciplines in terms of how people process information, right? All of that stuff should be mobilized and used when it comes to trying to figure out how to respond to the kind of the current situation. How are these issues widely framed by all of us? So I mean journalists, I mean um, you know, ordinary, ordinary users um, and, and, and readers. What types of rumors and images tend to circulate very quickly after these events? A really good example is terrorism, right? People always start to look for certain kinds of suspects. Um, and the internet, you know, tries to help with finding suspects. This isn't anything new. This exact same thing happened, for example, after the Oklahoma City bombing in, in 95, uh, when they were looking um, for people who looked like Timothy McVeigh. How hard is it to break these frames and these patterns? Again, from the research literature, we know exceptionally hard. So Robert Entman writes a lot about this. So one question when we're talking about these kinds of things, and this has also been mentioned earlier, is what could diversity in newsrooms contribute to this? So if you have a meme like Luti, what if you had a know your meme for journalism, right? What could a know your meme for journalism type of initiative look like that really moves beyond the flagging simply of content being false or not, right? So if you had this meme, what could a meme editor um, do in terms of offering users more than, you know, Snopes says this is potentially false, what other context could be brought to this so that, that there is a kind of a context around this piece of content that allows, uh, allows users to do much more with this. Tapping into research coming, for example, out of visual culture, media and communication studies, cultural studies, anthropology. So how can you build these deep and profound relationships that allow to do this kind of deeper digging? And then to kind of finish on a, a quote by Dana Boyd, this is why this stuff is really, really hard. And so in her quote, she highlights what we need to develop is social, technical, economic, and political structures that allow people to understand, appreciate, and bridge different viewpoints, right? There is an overemphasis, and I know that, that we've been talking about this you know, for a long time, but there's an overemphasis on the technical solutions. Technical solutions are going to do squat if you are not dealing with the socioeconomic and the political perspectives as well. That's it. <laughs> so. Hi, everybody. Um, so we've heard quite a lot about the complexity um, and the depth that memes can actually um, go to, um, and also the, the, the ways that they can be potentially problematic for journalists. Um, I'm here to tell you that despite that, we still have to care about them. So what the hell do we do about it? So just to give you some context, um, while I was, um, I have a background at The Guardian and The Times and, and as a journalist, my role now is to look after a curation team within Twitter that predominantly um, curates moments as well as other things on the platform. Uh, it's a team located in seven countries targeted to, in targeting content to um, 14, 15 different countries and that's growing all the time. Um, we absolutely and utterly have to cover these memes. The reason being is that as a curation team of Twitter, Twitter is obviously our journalistic or our editorial patch, um, and therefore we cannot cover a conversation that isn't happening. 
And when you look at the sort of age group that we're targeting, which is under 25s, the majority of that conversation will happen visually. So memes are critical to us understanding and driving and, and reflecting back to an audience the way that a news event has evolved and the way that their community is talking about it. So what are the pragmatic steps that we look at and we're doing day in, day out? Um, absolutely, as um, Farida mentioned, the, um, the Know Your Meme site is incredibly useful, but it is a bit too slow for uh, breaking news and the way that we are operating. So ultimately, it's about trying to understand um, our community and how, oh, or it's about understanding what communities we're reporting on and what they use to communicate and how they bond together. So I think, okay. So um, I wanted to provide a small amount of light relief because actually as a cultural entity, memes are as uniting as they are divisive. Um, we talk a lot about them being sort of substantially different from any, form of any other form of communication. They are not. So as journalists who understand the individuals in which you are reporting on, you should have the cultural knowledge to be able to support your understanding of, of memes. Um, very often, they are just there to reinforce people's sort of joy of shared cultural um, happenings. So for example, um, a small error with the way that a taco restaurant advertises its avocado. Get to Del Taco. They got a new thing called Free, free, free Shavakadu. Free Shavak. <laughs> free Shavakadu. Um, an absolutely critical meme that came out of, um, of Vine RIP, um, still living in our memories, um, uh, early last year. Um, and the way that it was remixed was essentially as a big in joke, a, a, a whole belief of reinforcing who we are how our lives work, what's important to us, and just the joy of the ridiculousness of it. So for example, everything from Free Shavakadu to Free Shavakadu. It's all about Free Shavakadu. So being able to bring people together that way is actually a really crucial part of, <laughs> of why memes exist. Um, they also give expression to, to, to complex things um, in a funny way. So, for example, um, does, if I look down at someone's shoes in this room and ask them, what are those? Does anyone here, does that mean? You know, there's one person who knows what that means. It's amazing. And that's what I mean by these are very cultural and community focused in the way that they communicate. If you're not really part of that or study that or interested in it, it's, this would have passed you by. Um, I'll play the video, it'll help to understand, because memes, by their nature, are better at often communicating certain esoteric things than, than words. Officer, I got one question for you. you what are those? What are those? <laughs> the worst shoes ever, that's what those are. Um, and that becomes reinforced as a question that people then use to each other in a culture that is pretty highly defined by what shoes you wear. So frankly, if you walk into college and someone asks you, what are those? You've failed. You've made the wrong shoe choice. <laughs> but these sorts of things become cultural shortcuts. They, they allow people to be able to make statements much faster and more with using more emotion or more you know, whether that's humor or whether that's, whether that's anything else, um, uh, faster. Um, a, a complex one that a lot of people share is the sad Jordan theme, meme. Uh, sad Michael Jordan having a bit of a cry appears in many, many places. It's really transferable between communities because there's a large section of the world that feels that awkwardness about seeing strong men cry. And so being able to understand that helps in the transmission of that meme. Uh, but what does this mean from, I talked about talking about this pragmatically. Um, it means that you need people who understand the cultural context. You need human beings. Um, they're a really, really important part of this. It's not, as um, Claire mentioned, it's not just as simple as identifying a dodgy URL. This is about having a substantial context, context to what's being um, distributed, including historical. 
Um, I, we are still learning. We are, um, we're a team that's existed for 22 months now. Um, and we share information with each other. We build up profiles of different things that come, come through based on different subjects and try and track and inform other members of our team globally if we start to see something emerge. But I don't think we're doing it as um, consistently as um, certainly the information in this panel has suggested, and, and I think we should be. I think that there is a need for, just like if you were moving into a um, story that involved a different desk from you, you would walk over to that desk editor and ask for a briefing. I think it's important for us to understand where these memes are emerging from and have someone within our newsrooms who are able to provide us with that briefing, whether that is a desk editor or someone specific to the memes. I actually personally think that rather than having one person, we should be making sure that if you really care about the Black Lives Matter community, you should understand those memes. That should be your patch. Um, and we should be training people to help them to, to make that connection. Um, again, talking of Black Lives Matter, I was going to talk through this. I feel like we've taken up too much of your time talking, um, and this has been referenced before, but um, three years ago, I did a study on Twitter by um, documenting the uh, most common uh, refrains or the most common ways that this sentence was finished, my mum doesn't understand. Um, and one of the top things that people talked about on Twitter about my mum doesn't understand was reaction texts, image reaction texts. My mum doesn't understand it, so I'll reply with something that's visual and it, she'll be lost. And that was already a sign of how visual a generation has become. And if we don't engage in that visual um, language, then we're not doing journalism for that community of people. Um, and everything about the Pepsi issue yesterday showed that, because the way that people responded was visually. And that is not to take away the um, integrity of it in any way, shape, or form. I think um, you know the fact that um, you know, people um, combined it with historical evidences of, of police um, um, aggressive police behavior against people of color, um, even taking a very common meme about people um, trying to pretend to be cool and fun and directing that back to um, Pepsi it was trying to send a really important message. Uh, the words underneath the skateboarding dad is, how do you do fellow kids? Um, so it really helped to communicate that the, the advert that Pepsi, um, did ever, does everyone know about the Pepsi ad? Sorry. We've been talking about it for the past 10 minutes. Um, uh, a Pepsi ad came out yesterday. It's now been pulled. It was of um, Kate, uh, which Jenna? Kendall. Kendall, Kendall Jenner uh, taking a can of Pepsi to a white policeman who was guarding a protest. Um, there's more subtleties to it than that, but you can imagine the reaction to um, by the Black Lives Matter community and many, many other people on, on Twitter and other social platforms. Um, and to be able to like describe that anger, it happened visually. Um, and I think the, the one that really stays with me is uh, the daughter of um, Martin Luther King Jr. and the way that she remixed a historical picture of her father with some of the um, advertising um, slogans of Pepsi. So understanding the power of this is important, understanding the complexity of it is important, sharing knowledge is important, but it's not beyond journalists who understand the context of their communities. Thank you. All right, we have about 13 minutes for um, question and answer. I'm gonna kick one off actually with Ann was about to sit, I guess she's reshuffling. So one thing that's really interesting is memes are originally part of digital culture, but we see it actually kind of bleeding offline into, in, an, in interesting ways. And like, why is that? Well, I think um, we, we it's, I think it's always been the case. It's just more apparent. Uh, there's a concept called digital dualism, which is uh, the notion that the online world and the offline world are separate, that they're dualistic. But really, we should think about them as an ecosystem. 
and so, um, so I think it's um, it's always been happening. Internet culture has always influenced offline culture, and um, but now there are certain technological mechanisms that make it easier for us to see that at scale. Um, so the reason I share those remixes of the red hats is that um, there are sites that make it easier for you, just like the meme shells make it easy to make digital memes. These are like physical hat shells um, to to make to to make remixes of the hats. So I often think and about the hats. Excuse me. Um, Pink hat, which hats? And, pussy the pink, hat. and the pink pussy hats are another another example from okay. the American context. Um, so there are technological enablers for these things, and um, um, but the, the culture remix and the influence of internet memes in offline culture has always been there. Um, and then for Joanna, one thing that's interesting is how quickly, the, in the case of the Pepsi ad, how quickly the metabolism of that spun up. I mean, it really was yesterday, and it's pulled down. I mean, from from your vantage point at Twitter and watching. Uh, the national, you know, the international and global conversation. How can you like walk through the steps of uh, of sort of uh, how something sort of explodes as you know um, as a meme? Um, so with the Pepsi one, it was very very visceral, and the reason it was visceral was because there is such a strongly defined community um, on Twitter, the platform that uh, thinks very much about um, uh, racial inequality and uh, police violence in America. And so the reason that traveled so quickly was, was because of that community. That community has also been um, an incredible source of memes and meme remixes over the last um, couple of years. And I think um, the fact that they are so well versed in that visual language was almost certainly one of the reasons why it exploded as quickly as it did. And then one thing that I'm very curious about is it's not clear how things get picked, or which things pick up? I mean, do you do you guys have a sense, either Claire or Farida or um, Joanna, like how things, what, you know, why things resonate with certain people and then sort of get amplified through conversation? I mean, I can kind of get it from the fresh avocado one, but it's less obvious to me why the, what are those, is, you know, of all the different vines that are out there kind of like hit and sort of perpetrate through popular culture. No, anyone got that one? goes back to community, right? right. Like, uh, I'm assuming that you and your colleagues don't judge each other by the quality of your footwear. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are a kid in high school in America, you sure care about what you're wearing on your feet. Um, and you may or may not, depending on where you are in America, have had slightly antagonistic relationships with the police. So it is really about the community and the cultural context that these things are produced in. Um, and ultimately, that will decide whether something resonates or not. I mean, it can be wide, of course. No, I mean, I think how many, I think there was literally one hand that went up with the what are those. So in terms of, you know, how successful are some of these things? Well, some are not successful at all. Um, and, they, and they circulate within very, very small communities. And one of the things that makes memes very complex to deal with is a lot of them are also kind of in-jokes. And so one of the things, I think the, one of the words that hasn't been mentioned is they're rife with intertextuality. So there's all of these layers upon layer that you kind of have to unpick. And in some cases, those layers are precisely there to, to leave people out of the interpretation loop, right? So this is for us, like we are the cool internet kids. Um, and this isn't for, for you, whoever you and us, you know, isn't in that situation. And so I think we, we mustn't equate memes per se with virality. Um, and so I think when we, when we look at the Pepsi ad, I think there is something really interesting that is happening there where you have kind of iconic images that most people in this room will have familiarity with, perhaps not necessarily with the Pepsi ad, so that there are different kind of ways in and sort of trying to understand um, how, they, how they might resonate um, in different contexts. But I think it's incredibly hard to, to predict why things might or might not go viral. I mean, my lab did a, did a study a couple of years ago around the refugee crisis and the, the images of Alan Kurdi, and, and I don't think anybody would have upfront said, this thing is gonna go crazy viral, and you know, more than a year and a half later, people who are demonstrating against Trump are still going to pull up that picture of a dead Syrian refugee toddler and use it in the context of protesting against, you know, the pro the pro-life demonstrations that were going on um, in January 2017. So it's I think it's incredibly difficult to to understand. But I think what we can learn is when they do take hold, what is it potentially that journalists could know about this, and this is really what, um, what, what Joanna was talking about, 
is it a responsibility now for journalists to understand that deep and rich history, given that clearly the communities that you are speaking to as journalists care about them? I think it's, it's probably worth going back to Pepe the Frog. Does everyone, please don't make me explain Pepe the Frog. Does everyone know what Pepe the Frog is? Okay, well, I'll just say it's an unpleasant meme. Um, but over the course of months and years, it has meant completely different things, depending on who is really owning the conversation around that meme at that time. So it is now very closely associated with racism. Um, it has been in its time simply associated with people who are so stoned that they can't really get on with the rest of their lives. So being able to be un understand how and when memes shift within communities and who's dominating the actual cultural definition of that meme, I think is really important. This speaks to something like we talked about last uh, last year. Is that it's for any given journalist, it's hard to know what these communities value, where these memes are coming from, and where the specific communities are. And I think there's a role to play. I love the concept of the Know Your Meme uh, platform, and you know the concept of like someone like a digital fixer, someone who can deeply understand and, and engage with a community, come from that community, and bridge the conversation that's happening within a memetic community, and uh, translate that for journalists. So that there's this dialogue. I think a platform could be a great way to do that, or just uh, working more in a more engaged way with people who are deeply in, in immersed in internet culture could be one, one step forward there. So we have six minutes left. Um, does anyone in the audience have questions? Yes. Is there a mic to go with the question? Uh, there's a question. Okay. So you mentioned, um, for example, the Trump supporters who would uh, try to help French users to um, bring their own memes into the debate and Pepper the Frog. Also, you have German accounts using Pepper the Frog and other Trump materials. Do you have an explanation why the right-wing scene is so meme-savvy? Because it's a bit um, fascinating since the right-wing ideology is basically one of strong national states and not necessarily of one of great internationalization. So do you have an explanation why in the political theory we see strong right-wing memes which go from country to country, but not, not so much left-wing memes, I would say? Yeah, it's a great question, and I'm not going to pretend that I know the answer. Oh, sorry. Right. Oh. On. There we go. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not going to pretend that I know the answer to this. I mean, I think um, globally, some really interesting research about so much of, uh, you know, anti-global sentiment, um, and that connects across countries. So anti-globalization, uh, and in many ways, is driving so much of what's happening. And so these kind of racist memes are a shortcut, essentially, crossing languages. So a lot of these kind of ideology, uh, ideological pers perspectives and positions, uh, you don't need to go into the complexities over text if you can all share the same green frog. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. I'm not, I'm not going to fudge the answer. Uh, I hope somebody's doing some really good research about it. I think the, the absence of left-wing memes, I think what we've seen since Trump's election is this certainly is not just, you know, when you think about misinformation. So, for example, the meme generator of Trump holding up the executive, um, what they're called, executive orders, uh, you know, that you can just put in there. Uh, there's a whole host of things we're seeing now from the left and the right. So this is just a human thing, uh, and it's driven by so many things that we're talking about, whether it's fear or ignorance. But, um, yeah, I don't think it's just a right-wing thing. But I think there are specific uh, elements at play uh, that we need to know more about. Okay. Just I, to jump in um, oh, very quickly, um, yeah, I think I, I think there's there are many um, examples of left wing ones. Um, hashtag refugees welcome um, has 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 crossed um, across the Atlantic. Um, there's uh, the hashtag Black Lives Matter and movement for Black Lives. I've also seen an international context. So I I do think that to, you know, just to reinforce Claire's point, it, it's it's very much a part of human culture, um, and that um, we can see it in all, on all political perspectives. Uh, there with a the mic as well. Hi, thanks. This has really been fascinating. I'm curious as to, for anyone here to talk about um, what their experience is of how newsrooms actually deal with this. Um, I can say from my experience, there probably aren't many newsrooms that have an, people who understand the sophistication of what's happening in a meme and the larger story that they 
they tell, they're sort of dismissed as a weird kid thing. Whereas as you've all talked about the sophistication um, and the understanding that you have to have in historical context. And, you know, just looking at the Pepsi one, I've seen Rosa Parks, I've seen Mahatma Gandhi, I've seen Tank Man. Um, it's kind of remarkable. And to me, the challenge is getting newsrooms to understand this form of expression in um, how they cover politics and culture. And I don't see it very much, but I will certainly share what you've had to say. So I'm curious as to your interactions with newsrooms. I mean, it's certainly not happening, but I'm kind of a little bit on the fence about whether it should be happening because so much of this is about communities. And so the idea that the New York Times has an 800 word feature explaining, and I'm sure they have done one on the Pepsi ad and that's crossed over, but there is that sense of, of th this is a response to from audiences who don't think they're being listened to and they're creating their own content and sharing their own content because they can. And so I think there's an importance in terms of newsrooms understanding what's happening and this goes back absolutely to more diverse newsrooms uh, and different people who can explain these memes mm -hmm. in a way that it's they don't have to go and do their research from knowing your meme they just know from their own like snap community or whatsapp right. community so that's a big part of it but i do think how we should be explaining these but i think but it's more about understanding and that should feed into other ways that we cover but topics. i'm not suggesting there should be a someone who has meme explanation as their beat, but just as one of the tools to understand how you cover a story. You know, if you're a business reporter, you should understand this because for Pepsi, oh, absolutely. It's, like, it's a crazy hit. But if you have no understanding of it at all, you might not have seen that this would be such a big, a, a big story. You know, you know what I mean? I think it's just understanding it in the context of the wider reporting you're doing, like the right-wing Trump supporters who yeah. memed their way to a president in the White House. That, that's, that's sort of the level at which I'm suggesting it, not as the meme reporter. No, I totally agree. And, and uh, not to go into the details, but Liz Spade, the public editor of the New York Times, wrote an article recently that was pretty embarrassing because she didn't understand internet culture and a whole mm -hmm. host of conversations. And that should not be happening. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. That business example is a classic example of how a business reporter is not going to take memes seriously until this. I, so, yeah. I couldn't underline diverse staff more. Um, I'm really proud that the Moments team is one of the diver most diverse teams in Twitter, and I am consistently learning day in, day out what that means for bringing together this amazing, varied group of incredibly digitally literate people. Um, and there is no one person who could ever truly understand all of the different memes. You have to provide an incredible cross-section of people. That's great. I think I'm getting the axe motion. Um, thank you very much. If you guys appreciate it, give it a, a hand for our panelists. And, and we are clearing out because there is uh, another panel starting here in five minutes because they back everything back to back for very strange things.